Hello, uh, my name's Sarah. I teach English Literature here at Huddersfield New College. Um, so I just want to give you a little flavour of what you would be doing if you decided to study English Literature here with us at the college. Um, and I want to just introduce you to a poet, William Blake, that you will study in the first year of the two-year course here. Now, William Blake was a famous radical, a visionary, a libertarian. He fought for freedom and for equal rights, particularly for working people and for children. And the poem we're going to look at today is Holy Thursday. It's uh, one of two poems named Holy Thursday from Songs of Innocence and of Experience. This particular poem can be found in Songs of Innocence. Normally, what we would do, obviously, is read the poems first of all. Um, so I'm going to read the poem to you. Hopefully you'll follow along. "'Twas on a holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean, The children walking two and two, in red and blue and green. Grey-headed beetles walked before, with wands as white as snow, Till into the high dome of Paul's they like Thames waters flow. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, these flowers of London town. Seated in companies they sit, with radiance all their own. The hum of multitudes was there, but multitudes of lambs. Thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. Now like a mighty wind they raise to heaven the voice of song. Or like harmonious thunderings the seats of heaven among. Beneath them sit the aged men wise guardians of the poor, then cherish pity, lest you drive an angel from your door. Now I want to talk to you about the importance of context when reading a poem like this. Because at first impression is that this poem is celebrating a kind and charitable society that gives willingly to support the most vulnerable children, um, particularly orphaned and destitute or abandoned children. Now, these children are mentioned in the first stanza, walking two by two. So they're obviously walking in quite a disciplined manner and their innocent faces are clean, which suggests to me that perhaps their faces are not always clean. But what I would probably do in the lesson is ask you that this poem, yes, it appears to describe a positive scene, however, is there anything in the poem that seems to signify that perhaps the scene that we're being shown here does not reflect the reality of these children's lives? So, if you were here in the lesson now, that's the question I would ask. And maybe in groups or in pairs, I would ask you to select any evidence from the poem that perhaps suggests that these children's lives are not as happy as this poem suggests. There are four things that we would need to look at to really draw out the, the true meaning of this poem. And all of these aspects of context can be taken from the opening stanza. So there are some key questions we need to ask. What is Holy Thursday? Um, and why are the children parading? Uh, who are these grey-headed beetles? And what's their real role in the children's lives? And also the setting of the poem. What can we learn about the setting and how can that inform our interpretation of meaning? Now, typically in a lesson, what I would ask is, again, I would put you into groups and I would ask you to look specifically at some of these aspects of context and do some research and find some evidence in the poem that you could use to perhaps inform your judgments about meaning. So what is Holy Thursday? Now, I can obviously, there's quite a lot of text here on the screen, but I would want to just take you through it. Um, Holy Thursday was the Thursday before um, Easter and it was an important Christian festival. There was an annual service for children from charity schools and these children from the poorest backgrounds would walk through the streets of London to give thanks to their wealthy benefactors who paid for the charity schools. Now these charity schools kept children in dire poverty and really these children were not well provided for however they're presented in the poem and the wealthy industrialists in the church um, served to in some ways benefit from these poor children because many of them 
once they had left the charity school, would work in mills and factories for the profit of the wealthy people who had funded these schools. Blake talks about more than 6,000 children having to be supported by charity and being marched through the streets to St Paul's Cathedral. And we have to ask, even though the speaker in the poem does not seem to ask this question, we have to ask why are there so many orphaned and abandoned children in London? And why so many children end up dependent on charity? So already our reading and our understanding of the poem has started to evolve given our knowledge of the context. Now there is mention in the first stanza of the Beadles who are marching ahead of the children, grey-headed beadles in the first stanza. They were officials who were appointed to maintain discipline and order, particularly in charity schools and workhouses. So the children would have been frightened by the presence of the beadles. And this wand that's described as a wand as white as snow, as though it were an innocent, as though it were entirely innocent, in truth is actually used as a, a sign of his authority and to punish and control the children. So according to the speaker, the beadles appear harmless, but given the context, we know that this is not the case. So the beadles make sure that the children keep in line and walk silently into the church, walking two by two. And the reader can see that if the charity schools had genuine care and true pity for these children, they would not subject them to threats or to such a harsh regime and threats of physical punishment, okay? Now, finally, the setting of the poem. What can that tell us about um, the true meaning of Blake's poem here? Well, it talks about the children walking to St Paul's Cathedral. And St Paul's Cathedral is one of the most impressive cathedrals in the country. It signifies enormous wealth and the enormous wealth and power of the church, the church who were funding these charity schools. So we are led to believe, how can it be that in such a wealthy city, there are so many poor children, thousands of poor children. And the simile, uh, again, like Thames waters flow, is intended to show just how many children were suffering in London at this time. The term multitude is repeated several times in the second stanza of the poem. Blake wants to throw emphasis upon the sheer numbers of children being abandoned, orphaned, or forced to live in terrible conditions or accept charity. And the poem ends finally with the line, then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door. Now this, is actually a quote from the Bible. And it refers to the notion that a society that has allowed so many children to have to rely on charity must watch out for God is watching. And those who mistreat or um, exploit poor and vulnerable children will be judged by God. So in the end, I think Blake is making a clear point that what we're seeing here is a distinct gap between how things appear and the reality. The reality is that uh, these children's lives don't in any way live up to the appearance of the parade. Um, what this parade is in the end is an act of propaganda. So knowing the truth of these children's lives by understanding the historical context, we can see the discrepancy between this scene in the poem and the reality. The truth, the truth is that institutionalised charity is far from kind or loving and, this, and that this parade of destitute children should be read as a source of national shame, not a source of celebration. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on the last screen, there is a link to a quiz so if you wouldn't mind completing that, that would be fantastic. Thank you.